Image processing plays a very essential role in numerous fields such as optics, computer science, mathematics, and surface physics. In case of computer vision, its applications include remote sensing, face detection, and fingerprint detection. It's very evident that image processing has numerous applications across various domains. Keeping the importance of image processing in mind, we have come up with this tutorial on image processing using Python. Now, before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud and digital marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now, let's have a quick glance at the agenda. We'll start off by understanding the concept of image processing. Then we'll understand the concepts of batch normalization and regularization. Finally, we'll have a comprehensive demo where we'll implement image processing with deep neural networks. So let's talk about the very first topic. Now, this is a big challenge in our industry currently. Now, why do I say that? Very simple example. Um, have you guys heard about NLP? I think yes, I have shown you some implementation. Yes. Yes. Also, you guys have heard about computer vision. Right. So what what basically these topics are is or we can also call uh, voice processing also now. And uh, what are these topics is you have got a pre trained data. That means if you're talking about NLP, you have got let us say if you're talking about within NLP, you're talking about uh, some kind of uh, sentiment analysis. What customer is talking about? Is he talking positive, negative, good, bad? about us so if you want to huge if you want to do this kind of processing on in bulk you can use nlp sentiment analysis here now to do this what you need is you need a very good corpus file a backend file of it yeah so why do i say we need a good back corpus file is we need to have all the possible combinations here itself so that i can train my neural network all right these files are usually very heavy um if i show you guys an example of it if you look at this this is a corpus file available with me for flowers so if you have if i want to if you give me an image and if i want to classify that image in one of these flowers i need these kind of images as a backup to train my model saying that this is a tulip okay for example or uh, this could be a tulip. So there could be some positive examples. There could be some negative examples. We don't know about. So this is the first challenge that we usually face. How to get these kind of corpuses. So if you talk about voice processing. Um, I'm not sure. Guys, have I shown you anytime anything on to voice ever? No. No, right? So just give yeah, me Last week you said something and it uh, perfect. It perfect. typed, right? Yeah. Perfect. So that voice processing, imagine how much level of voices it had to record to understand. So that corpus that we had was from Google. For now, it is free, so we are using it. Google was kind enough to gather certain people from certain ethnicities, certain regions to speak certain type of words so that whenever I speak something, it tries to match my accent and my word with the nearest value and tries to predict that I said that. If you observed last week, whatever I said, not 100% was a match, but yes, majorly it understood what I was trying to say. So the complete challenge for any neural network here lies to gather this kind of combinations so that we can train a network. That is what we call it as augmentation. Okay, you can relate that topic with augmentation. Now, what do I mean by augmentation? Let us say you have given this as an image to your neural network, saying that this is a cat. Now, what if I tilt my image? Or what if I rotate my image? Or what if I crop my image? What if I zoom in my image? Whatever you do with this. If in case, if you train a neural network onto this, only one picture saying this is cat, and if you present this to him, a simple neural network, it will not take it up. Why? Because if you observe the pixels present here, and if you take the same locations in your image, current image, there might be empty space. So obviously, it's going, not going to match it up. So it's very important for us to make sure that before we give a data to a neural network, 
we have done a proper augmentation. Augmentation means we have done these kind of changes. Now it is in our hand whether we have to do this. So there are certain functions available within neural networks which will allow us to do augmentation. So it will ask us if you want to rotate, if you want to flip, if you want to crop, if you want to zoom, whatever you want to do. All right. Sometimes even it allows us to change the colors also. So this is called data augmentation. So if I just present this, it's not a major topic, but yes, uh, it is much talked about because not all of us have a very good access to all these things. All right. So please remember, it says we may not have a big data set to create more data. So how to create a more data? You can create more data using your augmentation technique like this. All right, so just take an example of an augmentation. What we can do is this is an image which belongs to a dog. If you want to have what do you say, uh, transform the image, let us say from color, he is transformed into a grayscale. From there, I'm giving it to a CNN. Now, in this case, it is easy for us to identify. What if tomorrow the snow and stuff is not there, only this much face is available? We are not sure how comfortable your neural network will be. I think somebody's camera is on, guys. Yeah. How comfortable the neural network will be to identify that it's a husky, right? So in those cases, augmentation will be of a very good help. So this is one case where you can say I need augmentation and definitely in computer vision, you need a good backup of data. Otherwise, neural network is of no use. Okay. Um, what all we can do inside augmentation? So you can do flips, you can do rotations, cropping, scaling, color jitter means changing the you uh, and all this part of it. Uh, other creative techniques could be uh, if, if we talk about uh, convolution nets, it could be translation, rotation, stretching, sharing, lens distortion. So you can do a lot of things. Now you might be wondering what are these terms. This will come in the first week of computer vision where we will use certain filters on top of an image such a way that we will change the look and feel of the image. So this is something like you can, we can say on um, Instagram, you know, those instant filters are there. Yeah. Some of the filters, you know, they change the background, they blur the background and all. so this is what the filters are. So you just have to define a filter which could be multiplied with an image and you'll get a new image out of it. That's it. So this is what is by lens distortion, sharing. And all. all right. So this is augmentation. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. So in computer vision, we'll see the real application of it. For our neural networks part of it, we usually have a good backup data. It should not be a big trouble. All right. Now coming to weights initialization. Now this was a common, I think in the first session, a lot of people asked, do we actually put randomized weights? I will say it by default, we do it. But if we don't want to do it, there are certain different type of weights available with us. Let's see what are those weights. So uh, one minute, yeah. So this is the total weights that we can say we have it in, in our hands. Either we can use zero initialization. We can put all the weights as zero. Yeah, we can put random, random initialization. That is what we do currently. We have something called Xavier initialization. We have something called HE and there are many more. So if if you are a researcher in a company and all, if you want to do it, you can even develop your own weights and try it out. Now in today's case study that I'm going to show you, we will see random versus HE. So first we will, we will start with HE, we'll implement a model and then we will change it to random and we will check how the accuracy changes. All right. So these are the two common ones if you want to use it. So any idea where I can use zero initialization because you remember what is zero initialization? You're directly putting weights as zero. So no matter what your inputs are, the output is going to be zero only. Getting my point? So this is one, uh, yes. this is one little peculiar um, example of weights. So here they have shown what if, what happens when W is equal to zero. So the weights are zero. Definitely whatever is your input, let us say all of them are zeros. The same thing we are going to get as an output to be very frank. But if you remember inside this, we were talking about not only your input weight gets multiplied with input gets multiplied by weight, but also it gets added by a biasing factor. People remember that? So sometimes if you want to use a strong biasing factor with, you know, weights as zero, even we can do that. 
but the only issue is the output will be very diminished basically because the complete neural network will be running on biases uh, shoulders basically because the rest everything is zero so if i choose a very good activation function say like tan h or sigmoid where there are chances that anything which is zero or less than zero also has scope to pass plus a biasing factor there could be chances that yes you might get some outputs i will not say it's a very good way to do it but in worst case i don't know in certain situations we don't know if in case you need that even you can go ahead and initialize zero all right but uh, but 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 krishna um, the first the first time would be zero but of course the biasing factor will come into effect. but mm -hmm. from the second epoch things mm -hmm. will change right will it not add weight to the yes the 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 things will change from second epoch correct that's why i said the biasing factor will be the ruling uh, ruling thing over here so there are chances sure. that from the second point or third point we might they, we might start changing the weights itself so if you want to start with a very fresh you know you don't want any junk in your network you can do this but it will take some time it will take more epochs to come to some 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 normal number i hope you're getting my point yeah majorly these are the ones we use it apart from that random and he are the, the common ones so today we'll see both of them okay so i've given some some text onto that uh, if you guys like it i will publish the ppt you can just go through the same thing what we explained and if you want to learn what is he basically is the formula for he 2 divided by size of l minus 1 and i'll give you the complete details of that you don't have to get into that detail majorly because uh, we use always so far in my career i have never used he and xavier to be very frank could be used in a very you know tight constrained uh, environmental condition where you have you don't want the parameters to go certain beyond certain characteristics uh, values and all in that case you can use these two else random solves majorly the job okay so this was your weights so we can use any of them that's what i meant overview now moving on coming to the topic of regularization now what do you mean by regularization in machine learning do you remember we did something on regularization like standard scaling or clipping if the data goes beyond certain value like outlier treatment if you will remember something like that could be done here why say you have a neural network and uh, you have done a randomized weight kind of thing so when you give an input say you have given uh, relu as an output so in in all of these layers relu is an output so what happens is when your input gets multiplied with certain weights and goes to the next layer there are chances that you might get a magnified image or magnified signal of your current input there are chances depends on our weight we don't know also when it goes here there are chances that you might get a magnified version again yeah anyway it's going to follow relu activation function itself i agree but let us say if my my input was very low and because of weights it has got magnified so because of this issue what we do is we try to introduce one extra layer in middle of all of these that is what we call batch normalization or i will say standard scalar for a neural network so that whenever an output comes out of a network it has to pass through this gets normalized and then goes to the next one so that we have a check that whatever data we are giving is in bounds it's not going out of our bounds that's it sometimes it is useful sometimes it is not so tomorrow when you are doing a neural network and you are having an issue of overfitting or underfitting those times you can go back do this kind of feature engineering it's not necessary to put for all of them you can start with one or two and then if you see a positive result start putting for all of them we'll see today in our case study how to do that all right so this is called batch normalization fine so this is it um second concept of regularization is dropout dropout means a quick question to all of you now as i said there is no formula for neural networks as we said that there is no formula for out input uh, hidden layers there is no formula for total number of neurons within hidden layers we have not, no clue over it do you think all the layers and all the neurons are duly important for driving the output no no right? no right so it could be like we can talk we can say like that there are five employees in a company three of them are driving the project two of them sometimes they come and help sometimes they don't 
So even if their presence and no presence also not going to affect much. Definitely by removing them, the efficiency could come down because the burden on these guys will increase a little bit, but only for a certain point after that will normalize it. Same is the case here. Not all the weights or not all the neurons that we have are equally important. So what we do is we bring in a concept of dropout where I, if I say dropout is equal to 0.2, that means 20% of the neurons, please manually switch them off no matter what it is. Randomly choose 20% out of them and switch it off. Yeah, this could be used as an accuracy increase or model tuning part of it at the end. Again, if you ask me how 20% I got, random value. There is no formula for that. Start with 10%, 20%, 30%. Some of the implementations I've seen people going up to 60%, 70% and all this. I feel this is not a good thing. Why? Because we have only, we have only created this and now we are saying 70% 70 70 of the network is switched off. So it's a, it's, it's a useless hardware for us. We are keeping it empty. It's of no use. So rather than doing 70, 60 and all, what you do is you manually go and shrink them down. No problem. But I usually keep myself up to 50%, not more than that. It's not fair from our side to do it, to be very frank. So even you can do dropouts like this, where you can ask the network to switch it off. This is the dropout concept. All right. Now, uh, so, so this is what it looks like. So uh, here on the left hand side, they have shown a fully connected neural net. Here they have reduced certain uh, neurons out of it and the model gives almost a similar performance to this. So I can say that yes, in this case dropout kind of works. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, I feel this is a little silly example, but yes, it will create some impact. What it says is what if you have got some features so this particular neuron classifies that a particular image that we have given has an ear, it has a tail, it is furry, it has claws, it is having mischievous looks. So if you want to predict this as a cat, has, having an ear is not going to make a very big difference to your answer because there are a lot of animals who have that. Having claws makes a difference. I will say about this particular weightage, this should be given more weightage. So there are certain weights and neurons which could be switched off. And even if you do it, you are going to end up with some uh, classification, not a error basically. So this is just an example to show you guys. All right. So this is your dropout. <laughs> Another interpretation of a dropout could be, um, it is, it is, it will kind of, you know, simulate an ensemble model. Are you people able to get, uh, simulate this or, or understand what I'm trying to say here? Dropout uh, is training a large ensemble model. Do you agree with that? Uh, um, not able to connect on this point. Actually. Okay. You remember what is ensemble techniques? I think recently we probably three, four models back, you would have done this. What do you mean by ensemble? We have got weak classifiers, which are nothing but your individual algorithms. What we do, we combine them into one platform and then we take, let us say I give an input to all of them. And the input that I've given, actually the target column is zero. Let us say the first algorithm classifies it as one, next one is zero, next one is zero, next one is zero. That means I will take the majority out of all three of them and I will say, yes, my final answer is zero. So this is called a weak classifier. This is called a strong classifier. Agreed? This is our ensemble technique. So if you remember, we had done random forest, bagging, boosting, all those techniques. Yeah. Same thing. What if I keep, because every time I remember, I said every time when you rerun your model, 20% of randomly chosen values get switched on and switched off. So can I say in worst first cycle, these neurons will be active. Second cycle, it is possible that this neuron could be active and this neuron could be deactivated. You don't know. So sometimes in a possible scale, you can think this as a ensemble technique where you by mixing and matching various uh, neurons, you are creating a final answer. All right, just an analog, you don't have to worry about it. We are not going to implement an uh, ensemble here, just to give you a visualization of dropouts. All right, so this is it. So, so the challenge would be the training, how, how would the training be? Every set of training 
would be on a on on a set dropouts or would it be random within an epoch uh, among the epoch in one training session in one epoch same num- uh, in one epoch one set of uh, neurons will be dropped out in the next epoch there are chances not the same one gets back to it because as i said it's randomly chosen mm-hmm. so okay. dropout is is kind of costly sometimes for us because in one case in the last epoch let us say this was switched off let us say this particular thing was switched off so the weight was not improvised onto this so if i switch it on in the new epoch again i have to retrain his weight that's why i say it's a little costly affair to do this all right so not right. all right. of the times will do drop out worst case when the model is not improving at all we'll try to push some drop outs and even sometimes after pushing drop outs also model is not going to increase because of this kind of issue as i say <laughs> just a backup technique available with us that's it. and i i personally feel it is a waste of hardware <laughs> because if i have, if i have said that i need these neurons and if i switch them off i don't know it's it's not fair to be very frank yeah good so i think majorly this is what this is what you can do to tune your model and apart from this for tuning your model uh, you can use different type of epochs different batch size different activation functions uh say different uh, output functions different uh, optimizers whatever we saw today you can mix match them and change your uh, inputs and outputs all right so again if you kind of do mix match and trying to get it right then of course it just the best form of mix and match is your grid and random set random set exactly. exactly. and that's going to be that's very expensive so, <laughs> so this is more like a brute force <laughs> grid and random <laughs> so uh, we'll do one thing ramesh in this case is i'll introduce you guys to collabs i don't know if some of you already started using it collab has got a ram of- so 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 uh, sorry so last uh, i mean we all did uh, collab in last uh, recommendation engine because the uh, the size was so big that uh, all our machines kind of crashed so yeah. so we did last uh, last project almost everybody did in collab perfect so you guys are good at it so you, if you want to do grid search no do it in collab at least it will not be so bad as your computer at least the output will be faster to be frank but yes grid search uh, i don't think so it's a good uh, no actually even collab uh, for all of us uh, crashed on, uh, on 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 some of the uh, trainings okay because it went, went out of memory and we got an out of memory error uh, oh. when we had the constraints uh, a lot of parameters that we were training okay 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 good fine so let's see but uh, from my side uh, how i deal is i go by gut feeling and mix match so this is a little time taking uh, you know implementation that's why people sometimes refrain from using ai you know that's the only reason okay good so i think we have done so any business problem any business pro- so krishna any business problem that we use um, deep learning for or is it primarily uh, picture video audio voice nlp you know that type or is are there business problems also that we tend to use i know that the example also said that you can use any regression problem instead of machine learning you can use deep learning but any valid uh, business case that uh, you use it for yeah so majorly you use it for uh, systems which are dynamically changing first of all why let us say you have got a, a customer for example i'll give you Uh, we have a customer airbus for example yeah so airbus usually in uh, per minute per flight let us say of airbus generates around 3 gb of data for example i am not sure about it. say 3 gb of data is generated per flight per minute say not even seconds so what happens you have trained an ml yeah now just imagine if you wait for say one year how much amount of new data your airbus can generate or your company can generate so what's going to happen the data that you are have model you have trained on if you take the difference with the newer data and if you find there is a significant difference onto that what's going to happen this ml that you have designed is no more valid agreed yeah so what you have to do you have to retire it you have to retrain on the new data it is not dynamic unless and until you have a system where every day it gets retired it gets retrained and deployed back <laughs> if you have a system like that very good perfect 
So in these kind of case studies, you can bring in your neural network because neural network, if you just see whatever input you give, I will adjust myself and I'll give you an output out of it. Even this has to be called, no doubt, but this is much easier than this because if you remember in ML, you have to do a lot of changes. You have to do featureizations, tunings, uh, correlations, a lot of things you again you have to check and then you have to go. Whereas in this, we are free from all that issues. Even we do not even go and check for normality here. Do you people see that? That level of sophistication could be achieved by this. So this is one business. So we don't we don't we don't retrain as the data changes every day, is it? Is that what you're saying? Which one? Your neural yeah, network? Yeah, neural nets. You don't need to retrain it every day, is it? Is that what uh, yes. Because the data is changing is what you're saying, right? Yes. Because the data so, is changing, yeah. So data, mm -hmm. data helps us to retrain them. So we have certain, so when we go about, so when we cross the basic level of neural network, I will show you some more <laughs> which will mm -hmm. retrain itself. They are called self-healing neural networks. They will automatically retrain themselves. Right, right, right. So that is my next question. Recommendation systems. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. in recommendation systems under collaborative filtering, we had a topic where Amazon maintains your data. Now, how often this data table is adjusted? You people know that. You, you know mm -hmm. when a person, yeah, yeah. if you are doing a user-based collaborative filtering, the person will switch from might be from one group to another group depending on his choice and current values. So if Amazon says that I will keep a gap of 15 days, you know, to sync up my data, to refresh my data, what's going to happen for a period of 14 days, Amazon might be sending wrong recommendations to this customer because this customer has already moved out of that group. So what does this uh, Amazon has to do? Amazon would have be having a bot which will trigger this let us say every second or every 10 seconds so that whatever recommendations are thrown to a customer are not wastage because see even if you if you get irrelevant recommendations no you lose interest after some point so there is a business behavior problem and also a functional behavior problem because of this same thing we do it over here we have got some triggers which will tell the neural network to retrain itself on the newer data these are called self healing neural networks the best example I will give you is, uh, um, uh, I will say, Google car, for example. So when the Google car is on the road, so that, that's a topic of reinforcement learning anyway. It's a different domain again. But yes, what they do is they would be having a certain uh, triggers. So say every 15, 20 seconds, I have a system to identify faces or to identify obstacles on the road. Retrain myself because... Google does not know what new object is going to come and sit over there, right? So if it, if a car is not able to identify it, what's going to happen is going to, it might crash or it might stop, which might stop their business. So I, again, I'll say it's a very different level, but yes, this is what is currently going on in the market. So you would have heard about uh, coding bots. Have you guys heard about this? I'm currently working on one of them. You just tell, you just write the algorithm, the bot will code for you. So let us say you wrote something which bot is not able to get it. What it will do? It will take it up, it will retrain itself and then it will give you a solution back to you. You just have to scribble, you know, what is your algorithm? Mm -hmm. It will code it up for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Krishna, you mean like this Python code also, you mean that way? Yeah, yeah. Any, any okay. technology independent. Okay. Technology independent. So I was planning for an industry session onto this. Yet I am okay. yet to complete this. To be very frank, the basic working thing is with me. But the only issue is the corpus that I have. No, because I need to have a corpus. So let us say if I say hot encode my uh, variable. So when I say this. My bot will understand what is hot, what is encoded, it will try to search in my corpus. It will pick up one of my uh, index and from there it will pick up the code. That's very easy. Okay. okay. All I need is, I need this backend. I need somebody to make this up. Unless and until I go and edit it, it's not going to work out. So currently, I'm struggling with this. Okay. And I have... 
uh, use this also, Krishna. Like uh, some people are coming with this. Uh, you need this automated testing, right? That mm. itself they are using artificial intelligence. You have got any idea on that? Yes, yes. I have deployed one of them. I'll show you. Yeah. Um. Ha, okay. Like say I'm I'm doing a, a website. I want to automate it using AI. Means what do you do actually? Yes. Let me show you because I hail from that background. Okay. So I transitioned as a full stack developer to data science. <laughs> so okay. I have developed a system here. I will give you what the system is. See what used to happen is um, there is a code. Let us say. So this is my release number one. All right. So that, let us say in in this particular product there are release one, release two, and release one. Okay. Currently I'm on release one, and depending on my features that I have released in this stuff. I have done some manual, so I have a manual tester and I have an automation tester, both of them. Yes, work. yes. So in manual, I will say I can have somebody on performance testing and on functional testing and I will say on security part of it. That yes, works. yes, yes. On automation guy, let us say we talk about Selenium and UFT, the most famous ones. So okay. What happens is, let us say it's a web, so Selenium is connected to that, and this, okay. depending on the web features, the 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 the, the, the tester writes a script, and yes. they have a script ready which could be run on to my release number one. So let us say it takes around X days of time to do it. Okay. Now these guys come back with release number two. Now in this release number two, there are possibilities that the client would have changed certain requirements, and these guys have changed certain <coughs> patches here and there. Yes. Here. If I if I want to rerun the script, it will not run. I have to make changes here. Correct. So again, it will take y amount of days to do that. So Correct. what I've done is, as soon as you you bring in release two, I will compare release two with release one. Okay. I will try to find out places where there are changes done. Yeah. And you mean in the code? I, you mean in the code? You will find places where yes. there are changes. Yes. How will you do that? You will have this coding. Okay. Yeah, we use uh, NLP for that. We use NLP. So in NLP, oh. we will try to summarize what exactly that code does. But to do that, oh. we need a very good corpus. So if I write a code for you, let us see if I write a for loop for you. Okay. You should have good amount of for loops with me so that my code understands that, okay, a for loop does this job. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it is a very difficult task to get that corpus. But once you have the corpus in hand, uh, it is very simple. So now what I do is I try to find out the difference first of all. Okay. If I say, let us say my threshold value. If 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 the automation tester says that, if the changes is around ten percent of the script, it's okay. I will do it. You don't have to do a costly affair like this for me. But okay. if I say my code has changed by fifty percent, for example, in okay. that case, what I will do is I'll pinpoint the changes. And using a, what do you say, a, a traceability matrix, I will say if this is changed, a particular portion of my script also needs to be changed. So I will go and tell the pointers for the automation tester to go and change. That's it. Okay. And he has to re-script, I agree. But now he will know where to go and re-script. So this was the version number one that we deployed for uh, automation testing. But how you are connecting that code with the script, the testing script? So that we have a tool. We have tools for that. So we call it. Uh, you, you got track and others. There's an op there's a yeah. tool called track yeah. as well. So, <clears throat> oh, and and even uh, Jira allows you to do traceability. Jira does so it. Yeah. Um, there is something <coughs> called uh, IBM Rational, if I'm not wrong, that does it. IBM Doors. Uh, yeah. There are so many tools which does require so, management business analysis kind of thing. So you can intermediately use them to find a traceability matrix. That's it. So, so and, okay. and, uh, and also Ganesh, uh, just uh, digressing, but what uh, there are, there are some uh, tools which are called TDD tools, right? Test driven development tools. You can yes, look yes. for uh, tools like optimal trace, um, uh, computer associates, ARD and agile requirement designer is another tool. There are a few tools that is available. What you do there is you, your BA kind of specs, specs the whole requirements. Uh, like a business process diagram, and okay. uh, that kind of that kind of automates uh, tests. And when it, any change that happens in the code, you go back to the visual designer, change your requirements, and then it'll automatically uh, generate. The, look for these tools; they're not very cheap tools, but uh, but but they are uh, pretty popular. Okay, okay, sure, sure. I, 
Yeah. Uh, DDD tools as they call. Yeah, but, but the code uh, code generator, you know, I've uh, uh, Krishna, I've, mm. I've I've seen quite a few startups uh, in code generator. There's one very popular startup in Canada that just started uh, mm. last year and gained a lot of traction. There's one in Bay Area as well. Um, mm. uh, I'll try to look for them, but they they've. They've been very uh, stub generation, scaffolding generation, right? They just couldn't go beyond that. Correct. That's what I felt, right? But, and, and of course, today, Krishna, you, if you uh, are looking at it, I mean, we should also look at uh, the, all the open sources in Git, which is publicly available, you know, and try to train models uh, based on all Git handles. Uh, most of the, um, whatever, cyber uh, uh, ethical lackers do that, right? They just yeah. go look at all the code and find out <laughs> where there is a so, leak. So what I did was, unofficially what I did was, uh, whatever internal tools we have in my organization, no, we collected all the codes with good comments, you know, with, with functional comments, I can say. That what does the below patch do, where it starts, where it ends. If you can get hold of very rich corpus like this, then designing this in NLP is not a big job at all. The only issue which I found was sometimes the code becomes very generic to be very frank. So if you have a very high fi customized codes that will not work here, the bot will, uh, will, will produce very generic stuff, but yes, down the line, uh, we are evolving. And also I'm expecting some of these larger companies like Google and Amazon to share some charity corpuses with us <laughs> so that we can go ahead with this, you know, on a public forum. Otherwise, what's going to happen? Every company will have this confidential stuff. You know, we, see, I cannot share it with you guys. Why? Because the codes are internal, to be very frank. So we will still wait, but this is going to be the next big thing where we will replace the coders itself. So I can fire up virtual machines, injectors, which will behave as my coding guys and let them develop it. <laughs> yes, the only issue is where you need a little, little, little bit of customization. That's where human interf interference will come. Now. Coming to this topic, what we did now, the next version, this was version number one. The next version, what we did was we collected all the changes that the automation person did, you know, as a corpus again. So we gave this back to our database. Okay. The next model, what we did was even we were recommending that if this were the changes found, you can put this script, but that was possible only for one particular production environment. That means, if you have got a project which has got similar releases, it is possible only to there because of the business logic problem. Yeah, okay. it's not generic. So let us say if we are talking about Mercedes Benz. So for all the topics or products related to Mercedes Benz, this model could be trained and applied. But if you bring in some other account, it will not because the business logic over there is different. Because sometimes we have SAP and all flying around in the middle. You know, so when SAP comes in, you know, you guys, uh, if you guys have worked on it, there are a lot of business logic switching going here up and in those cases, these things will fail. But yes, in a similar environment, it can give a very good recommendation. So as far as I know, we have <coughs> seen a good amount of, I showed a very good ROI onto this, especially on the billing of automation testers that we have got a very good uh, number. Yes, we need some manual switches here and there, but yes, it was predicting very good. Also. It was a big time success. But now what is happening is this was an open, like this was developed from multiple tools. So tomorrow, if one of them collapses, the whole system will collapse. So the bigger companies like HP, Tricenters, uh, SAP, all these are coming up with their own uh, models. So like if you talk about SAP, there is something called solution manager. If you guys have worked upon that. Now there are analytic options given inside solution manager. Workflow, workbench, dev, uh, what do you say, type uh, options are there. So you just script it, you will get the logic out of it, the whole, the whole logic out of it. So these things are now replacing these kind of models. They are packaging it up, making it universal and selling it out. So soon even you might find there are packages inside UFT which do this. Soon. There are some news on to that. I hope you people are aware about UFT, or at least from uh, Ganesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, this maybe I need to also. Uh, I'm just finding where to start. Or maybe I will also start. With Do it. one thing. You connect with me offline. I'll I'll yeah. show you how to start this up. But I cannot yes, yes. show you something. But yes, 
I can give you some basic corpuses, or else yes. I can write, we can we can refer to some of the Git codes, download it, comment it, and use it as well. Yes, yes, yes. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, so, cool. so 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 what I'm trying to say now is the the thing that is going to happen after your this module that is your computer vision and NLP that will be of different level basically. So these all are the applications or outcomes of these mod modules. To be very frank, yeah. So again, I will say uh, ML was good, but uh, this is what is the next future. So some of you who are very senior over here in your organizations, having an idea onto this, you can do a lot of proposals to your clients. You know, you can do a lot of cross selling basically. So majorly, if I tell you my experience, I started, I, when I started these things, I started cross selling within my organization itself. So slowly, slowly we developed a team where we used to take certain percentage of the total project budget out. And we were trying to survive ourselves. You know, you are not a cost to company anymore because of these stuff. So you guys also can start your transition that way. And uh, um, will, will be will be nice if you could share some examples. Yes. Probably the code is one, but any low hanging fruits that you may yes. have. Yes. So yeah. what I've done, Ramesh, is, uh, I have, mm -hmm. what I've done is I visited Great Learning Office recently, and I be, I proposed to Shobita and other program managers, what if we can have a special session where I can show you people from different industries how to pick up a problem, how to get the data how to prepare the documentation and the plan, how to code it, how to deploy it, and finally how to deliver and manage it in one particular session from different- That'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. perfect. That'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah perfect. It's so they've agreed yeah. to it. I'm just waiting for the dates given to me so that we can set up one, one industry session for all of my batches together. Because we have got a variety of people from variety of industries, you know, so it'd be very easy for you, for you guys to even build up your CV or from where to start in your current career. I don't expect you guys to directly jump onto data science job, not possible. First, you try something and then put it on resume and then scale it up. All right. Also, let's see right. what they say and the date finalized by that. But yes, it is approved to be, to be sure. sure. Super. So just one thing, uh, Krishna, um, uh, your sessions are super helpful. Um, uh, the uh, the videos that come up, um, I mean, I, I really love the clarity, all IIT professors and people like that, but they're very, very scary and in intimidating because of the uh, maths and the yes. formulae and, and yes. things like that. I know both are important, but, but I feel there is a, uh, what, what you talk is, is very relatable, understandable, uh, but I think the maths and the under the hood stuff that is there in the video are also equally important. Yes. So, so that is where our uh, eyes are kind of popping up, <laughs> popping out, you know. No. So what video. happens is, <laughs> why do they have two different people uh, interacting with you is, one of the person is interacting from the academics point of view, so that you get to know how this is done from the ba base part of it. Because not all of us are very good in theory. You know, some of us are very good in implementation. Some of them are very good in idea building. So for the people who are very good in, you know, for those who want to know from basic, from scratch, formulas, derivations and all, the videos are designed for those guys. And why do I come in as why my, what my flavor is to show you guys what happens on what is needed on the industry, the practical deploy, uh, no, practice kind of. Thing. So in that case, we don't need, you know, deep stuff there. I just, we, we <laughs> just um, the third and deploy. That's it. Be very clear. Yeah. This is how delivery is done. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so we don't need the uh, deep learning and deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason great learning is giving you both the flavors. You know? All right. All right. Super. All right. And the third flavor comes from these extra industry sessions where you get to know if they have done a deployment, how do they do it? Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, once I get the finalized dates, I'll publish it to all of you. I think even awesome. you get connected. So. The first thing that we have for today's case study is, so now we are, I think now you guys are, uh, I would say good with uh, understanding what is the network and why do we need uh, propagations and what basically it helps us with, all right? So keeping that concept in mind, what we'll do today is, we'll try to go a little deep. We'll try to do image processing using uh, neural networks. So we will try to import <clears throat> a set of data 
Now this set of data. Now, now, now the real challenge starts because uh, now you guys are you guys are you know comfortable with using a data set which is form it is present in the form of uh, some kind of say independent columns and target columns and all. So that's all you have. You guys have done so far. Now what we'll do is we'll try to work on something onto image processing. So we'll try to see how images are stored inside a larger file, what exactly is an image, how computer interprets an image, and how we can do image classification using neural networks. All right. So just for example, <clears throat> for today's data set, what do we have? We've got a Keras uh, uh, inbuilt uh, data frame or data set or data images, which we call it as MNIST. Yeah, and this is a fashion basically a fashion apparel uh, data set wherein you will find uh, all the type of fashion apparels like t-shirts shoes boots uh, uh, pants lot of things are there so we have some classes say from zero to nine and is each of this image somebody has already tagged it so please remember image is as it is there is nothing new into we know this but somebody has tagged the image that means if this is the first image somebody has said that this belongs to class number zero could be a t-shirt this one said this belongs to class number nine could be a shoe for example so this is a new concept for you guys and uh, somebody has already done it for us down the line when we enter computer vision there in case possible we'll try to make some codes where we should be able to tag these kind of images and make our corpus all right so for now please get comfortable and understanding that this is how the data is and this is how the classes of the data tagged by somebody it is already inbuilt within mnist data set in keras all right now what we need to do is we need to design a neural network combination of forward and back propagation such a way that if i give any image it should be able to give me one of the nine softmax outputs will get activated and tell me which output it is so that's what we are going to do today so we'll try the convention way of neural network the normal way we do it first way second way is we'll try to do all of this augmentation part so i think last week we, did, we discussed about uh, weights and augmentations and all that right if i'm not wrong we have done this last week right yes I think I yes, yes. yes yeah yeah perfect so today we will see how exactly we can use these kind of feature engineering over here to improve the accuracy all right so this let's say we can we can take around one hour to complete this case study and after this particular thing um uh, next topic that we are going to do is we'll discuss your project your project is almost related to this i can say it's not the same data but yes it's an image data so first of all i'll make you guys comfortable with what is exactly that image data what it has how to visualize it and after that i'll give you the flow of the complete project and uh, probably it should not take more than 30 minutes onto that and still we have 30 more minutes what i will do is i will introduce you guys to the concept of convolution neural networks that is the topic that is basically cnns are used for image processing purely so now whatever next two months we are going to do we are going to do only cnns almost eight weeks we are going to do only this topic so it will help you guys to you know uh, pick it up further so we are running a little ahead than uh, our normal schedule so let's try to use that half an hour onto this these are the nine uh, or these are the ten uh, what do you say classes into which the data is completely divided so if you look at it this is how the data set looks like so if I, if i if i have to publish a image what i have to do is there are multiple ways of doing it since we are using matplotlib here what you guys can do is you can just use image show within matplot so you have to show the image what the image is the image is some kind of data what to show some end value of the image so basically uh, whatever number we are talking about and finally we will you know how do i say uh, publish it so let me just start from scratch and then we'll try to train it up so the first thing is uh, matplot uh, we are then we are getting into sklearn so we are train test split then we are getting the data set from keras then we are defining your sequential modality and here we are using our uh, one hot encode label for keras right so let's rerun it 
the data already the the whatever data is now we are going to use from keras and also tensorflow sometimes they are already having a split or internal splits called x train y train x test y test so they are already already aware about that so all we are doing is calling it uh, and invoking the function so we'll do one thing is we will publish this in the form of the data that you guys are comfortable with all right so let's try to push this number here what does what what am i trying to do here is all i'm saying is get my math plot then plot the figure say i want a 10 sized ranged figure uh, uh, from the range of one let us say one to ten uh, show this up and what to show to publish is your uh, x so in this case in our case it is x train basically so i'll just copy it and i'll paste it here and the image is for now grayscaled so i will not say grayscale we will keep it empty so by default it will come a colored image or rgb three channel image so we'll see what is rgb and all down the line and next thing what we are seeing is we are also publishing the top 10 uh, target values attached to it so instead of y i will just put y tree all right let's see all right so if you can observe it here we have got a variety of clothing apparels over here and attached to that these are the tags which are attached to it so we can we can just quickly verify if everything is okay yeah and if you want to look at the tags uh, this is this is what the tags are so they are they, the, each image will get one of that okay Next thing is, uh, before you guys start onto any project uh, or any of these image processing complex things, what you need to understand is what is the shape and size of your data set. So all you do is just copy this and try to publish the shape. We have got around 60K of the training data and 60K of uh, total outputs. These are nothing but these kind of outputs. And each image is of size 28 cross 28. Now, what exactly we mean by this? Guys, are you able to get this uh, 28 cross 28? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So we will do one thing. We will we'll talk about how to reshape and how to play around with pixels and all in once we enter computer vision. For now, for neural networks, all we need to know is we'll accept whatever is the input, but we'll make sure we know this. Why? Because we have to create a uh, neural network which is a flat version of this so for number of inputs we need to keep a track on what we have it here all right so here also i have done the same way i've just tried to publish some of these uh, images with their labels now coming on to the pre-processing part of it what exactly you need to uh, pre-process the data so the first thing that we need is we will reshape the data to n 28 cross 28 so sometimes what happens is these images are individual so here we already have this format which is n is nothing but 60,000, 28 cross 28 we are already in that zone so you don't have to redo it but this is the normal process every time you uh, if you remember your unsupervised learning before we enter any of this unsupervised learning algorithms we are supposed to uh, do normalization onto that similar to that a reshape a quick reshape should be good so that we are in sync so what are we doing now is uh, neural network will not be able to process a three-dimensional uh, network, uh, three-dimensional matrix like this. Now, why it's 3D? Because what does it mean is, it has 60,000 images, each one is this much. So neural network will not be able to get it because we have to flatten it up. So what we'll do is, we'll try to multiply these two, okay, and try to convert into a unique shape, right? So what are we saying is, Please reduce one dimension out of it and just keep the total shape as it is. That's what we mean by that. Krishna, Krishna, sorry to interrupt. Dr. Krishna, hmm. how would a three dimensional Krishna? It's 28 into 28, right? Each image yeah. is 28 into 28. Correct. You have got 6,000 6, images. Yeah. Then uh, single image is 28 into 28, two dimensional. Yes, only, because right? they're packed like that. The data which is which has been packed, no, it is not in the form of individual images. They are zipped together. Yeah. And inside a larger zip, there are smaller data sets available like this. So whenever an image is packed, no, they, the dimension is like 60K total uh, matrices. Each matrix is 28 cross 28. So now if I want to flatten it up, I'll not be able to do it. So what I will do now is I will just say, keep me, uh, keep this particular data as it is and try to reshape. All right. Okay. So okay. what I will do is now I will say there are 60k images, and each image has say around 
784 or whatever number is uh, uh, 784 uh, variables that's what it means right? 784 is 28 into 28 right uh, yes 28 into 28 is 784 we are reshaping it and we are just saying that see what all we need if I want to pass this to a neural network what all I need I need some number of inputs yes so just, just this inputs we are having one particular number and now we can flatten it up but what I but my clarity is images RGB, right? So yes. so for R for R channel you will have twenty eight into twenty eight for G channel you will have twenty eight into twenty eight. Yeah. It is that stacking you are talking, or the six thousand itself is a stack. I no, no. confused. Six thousand is total number. Here we okay. are not defining channel as of such. So the, I will not say this is a pure image. This is a pure data set on CV computer vision. The okay. normal data set that you usually look into computer vision looks like this. Say sixty k, okay. comma, number of rows, comma, okay. number of columns, comma. There should be a mandatory channel available. So if I write one, that means it's a grayscale image. If I write three, that means it's an RGB. Yes, yes. Red, green, and blue. Yeah. So if yes. we are giving this as an input to one of the computer vision codes or algorithms, yes, this is the default format. But for neural network, we can ignore this for now. Okay. okay. I'll tell you why. So okay. just for clarity purpose. Guys, what is an image? Very simple. Image has three channels back to back. One is called R, one is called G, one is called B. Now each pixel in this image is divided between say if I say one pixel is equal to one bit or one byte I'm sorry if I say that word how do I do it to power the shape and size of my pixel so if I say if it is one byte I will put it eight minus one that is 256 minus one that is 255 I will say if I keep this in my mind the complete coloration of this image will start with zero being the lightest color and 255 being the darkest color on each channel. So it could be R, it could be G, it could be B. All right. So what I can do is I can differentiate all of my pixels like this. Now, when you are combining them for computer vision, what are we doing is we are doing convolutions. Convolutions means in neural networks, what are we doing? We are multiplying them with random weights, right? In CNN and convolution neural networks, we are multiplying with random matrices, each of these. All right, I don't want to confuse you guys much, but yes. So in that case, what we need is we need all the three channels because I'll multiply my filter with all three of them separately and we'll get one output. That output will try to process it further. All right, that's okay. the reason we are talking about R, G and B. So we will see down down the line if today if time permits we'll go detail into this. Okay, like okay, to, okay. Like to be introduced with uh, with image processing. All right. Okay. So this is a very complex topic. That's the reason if we can start a little earlier, your journey will be better. All right. So now we are moving on. So let's say I run this. I reshape it. Uh, yeah. Now, please remember if you look at the categorical column here. If I go back to my shapes. Is the categorical column fit to be fed into neural network, guys? All right, I need to transform this somehow. The category mm -hmm. is nothing but zero to nine, if you can observe here. Is it is it fair enough for me to pass this? Is this enough for neural nets, or should I do something else? It should be basically transformed in a matrix rather Perfect. than this way. Perfect. So it should be in the form of a a squared matrix or an M cross N matrix. Why? Because the out the softmax output does not get what is nine. The softmax output gets, let us say there are 10 outputs, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If I say, if I say that the output is a uh, ankle boot, yeah. Let us say if that is the case, in that case, what is the softmax output? Zero, 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 one. So if this is there, then softmax gets it. Yes, this is one output. So all I all I will do is I will convert this in the form of one hot encoded output. That is nothing but this nine will look like all the zeros with one one. This zero will look like in the first place it will be one, remaining all will be zero. So I'll have an m cross n, uh, sorry, ten cross ten matrix at the end of the data. All right. So for that we have a very simple uh, function called two categorical within Keras. So I have just imported it above, and here I'm using it on my y variables. I've trained, I have solved my x. Now I'm solving my y. 
And finally, you publish the size of the data. This is how it's going to look like. 60K, 60K matching. 10, 10 matching. 784, 784 matching. 10, 10 matching. All right. So this is how it looks like. Now coming to implementing a neural network onto this. So what we'll do now is, um, uh, they call it FCNN or multi-layered perceptron network. They all mean the same. Whatever network we have done so far, same thing we are doing. The only thing you might find a little bit different uh, over here is now we are using, usually I put activation in the layer itself. This is almost a new way to do it. So you can add it and then you can add activation, add a layer activation, add a layer activation. So we'll try to do a simple network first. And if I'm not running it right away, because if I run, it's going to take some time. So this is my network. Now you may ask me, fine, how many layers have you done? I would say the number of layers are one, two, three, four, and five. Total five layers I have. And I'll not say it's an optimal way of doing it. We'll just try. If I have five layers, out of them, four layers are my activation layers, uh, the layers with nonlinear activation. And the last one is nothing but your uh, softmax out. Next is we are defining our back. Uh, so a, a dense is nothing but the, a, the number of a, a neurons, right? Yes, correct. So in this case, we are having 50 of them equal. No change in that. And finally, we are converging it to total 10 because there are 10 classes here. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, the only, only thing uh, different over here is you will feel is 784, which is coming from our inputs. And this 50 is nothing but the weights which is going on to the next network. So all should be in sync, basically. Okay. So now moving input on. Shape, input shape should be the same as the number of the, the Correct. parameters Correct. we have. Correct. So not total, but yes, one image is equal to 784 uh, numbers. Correct? Yeah. So if yeah. I flatten this up, I'm going to get 784. 784. One into 784 is going to be 784. That's why we are using perfect 784 here. Okay. You can go more than this also, but what's going to happen is, in that case, if in case just by mistake, you take more number of neurons here, no? then we have to control it using batch size here. But again, I will not say it's a good way to do it, but just in case, that's the reason we always have a habit of publishing the shapes right before implementing your network so that you are in sync, All right? Good. So now moving on to your optimizers. So we have defined an SGD optimizer that is stochastic gradient descent. Now, if you ask me what is basically difference between Adam, SGD, RMS prop and all, it is all about the formula using which they calculate the loss. That's it. And how they reach to the optimal points on gradient distance. So for time being, let us say, so far we used Adam always. Let's try SGD. And it's not mandatory to give learning rate. If in case you want a faster learning, this is what we give. If you want a little slower version of this, you could have given the standard value that is 0 0.001. Okay. Finally, we are saying the loss is categorical because we have a categorical data. So we are saying categorical cross entropy and the matrix that we are using is accuracy. As simple as that. Okay, so this is one. Uh, so, one uh, here the weight would initialize by default or should we have to specify? No, so for our first network, it is default one. Okay. Down the line, when we go ahead, we'll try to initialize the weights like this. Remember, you remember HE normal? Yeah, the, the HE weights that we did last time. So we'll do this also down the line. So for the first time, it is randomized weights. Okay. Now, so now, in, in, the, in the sessions that we saw in the recorded videos, mm -hmm. they, they told us that um, there is a by default uh, initialization, weight initialization in the uh, model itself. Mm -hmm. Which is mm. the, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the method, mm. but mm. The, the professor was saying that it is currently the best initialization method. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so always remember one thing, these weights, um, in my career, I have never played around with weights, to be very frank. So just to show you guys some kind of uh, difference between uh, default weights with uh, uh, newer weights, okay? Uh, I have done this uh, stuff. Otherwise, I never initialize anything here because the default weights are the best because that's the reason neural network is hit. Since we have no control over it because of that, it is the best. To be very frank, why? Because if we have control over it, we'll try to push what we like. And when we do that, we end up messing up our back propagation also. All right? Okay. 
perfect so we'll see down the line performance difference between this and that both so now when i run my uh, network now you may ask fine how do i get the number 200 so again i will say oh today i will show you some different implementations where how you can just this numbers and also i will show you something called early stopping so there is one function available uh, with us so for normal neural networks we don't need it because they don't take much time if you see this but if you look at my computer vision code let me show you the computer vision code i will show you the time so each epoch takes 78 seconds to process all right one more example if i show you my vgg example each network here takes 20 if each epoch here takes 25 minutes to process so if i show you yeah if you look at this the epoch the first epoch it was in midway i stopped it because of time issue it took around 17 minutes and still 17 more pending to complete so if 50 percent is 17 the total would be around 34 minutes to be very frank so what we do is in these cases we do something called early stopping i'll show you down the line so once we are comfortable with this then i'll go to that concept also so in that case we'll be able to judge this number of epochs on how many were epochs you put doesn't matter it will try to give you the best results yeah let's see so here i'm saying batch size so what do i mean by batch size at a short 200 images are kept in a queue one by one so one fetch is equal to 200 images depends on your cpu if you have a high performance cpu better use a better a bigger number all right epochs uh, if you are new to it start with a smaller number of epochs observe the difference of loss or by accuracy and then uh, scale it up if you feel that the accuracy is increasing in a better way scale it up there is one more way of judging it using some kind of graphs i will also show you down the line how to do that all right krishna like uh, when batch says 200 means when the batch is repeats itself four times one epoch will get completed right 784 is there right yeah so 784 is the size of one image ramesh so, see if if i take one image if i pixelize one image one image okay, is okay, 28 okay. cross 28 okay, so okay one okay, image okay. is 784 oh yes yeah, yeah, so, so, so. So like that okay. you multiply 200 to that this is in q Okay, 200 okay. is in queue. The data has been fetched up already in one execution cycle. One by one, it has been thrown. Okay, all right. So, one epoch runs across almost all the images. If you observe here, we have taken all the images, all the training images into picture. Yes, okay. So, yeah. front and back happens for all of them, and then one epoch gets concluded. Okay, why did I say so, okay, that? Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, if you are training on all, all 60,000 uh, images, hmm. what is the purpose of the batch size? Yeah, the purpose of batch size is, see, it's, it's upon your execution cycle. So let us say your um, fetch, uh, your, your CPU is of a larger GP, uh, RAM, basically. So it is having some capacity to store some backed up data so that computer or python does not have to again ask for new image and then get it back onto your machine if it is already queued up what will happen is one by one will keep you know one by one it will be start it, it, it will have a kind of uh, you know standby mode so as soon as one uh, image is done in another image will be thrown immediately that is what we mean by batch size Okay, so the image would be stored in the RAM, so the processing would be faster. Kind of, yes. So I will not say you'll make a much difference of it, but you can observe the epochs will go very smooth. It will be very of smaller size, basically. Okay. You don't, it doesn't so have just, to basically wait. The objective for is just the processing speed has kind got of. nothing to do with accuracy. Kind of. Nothing to do with the performance. Correct. Okay. okay. So some of uh, you, some of your computers will be having GPUs. If I'm not wrong about it, some of the latest ones has GPU. In that case, you don't even have to worry about this. GPU itself is powerful enough to take it forward. Yeah. Okay. So now, moving on. So finally, uh, okay. There is one more way uh, we could have defined our validation data here itself, something like this underscore data so we can put our x test y test like this or else there is another way to just uh, process the evaluation over here so model dot evaluate and you put your testing data here so when i do that i will get an accuracy of 64 but if you look at our training accuracy 
we get an accuracy of 66. So I will say it's not an overfit model, but yes, it's also not a good model. So this could have happened because of our negligence of getting the good uh, network here. So we have just for namesake, we have given some values and some of the network is run and it has given us some junk value. All right. So now the choice is what if you guys are stuck like this? So this is just to simulate whether how to improve a model tune your neural network. All right. So this is one problem. Now let's try to solve one by one. So let's first of all, try to put some weight initializers. Okay. So if you want to go in detail about weight initializers and how many we have, this is the link given. You guys can just have a look at it. The one which I have, let us say, we are using here is HE normal. So there is one formula, if you remember from the last PPT. So what are we doing is the same network. We are not changing it. If you observe, all we are doing is we are saying my kernel initializer will now be HE normal. So there will be some predefined weights which will be thrown. And anyway, those weights will be adjusted. Why? Because we have a backprop happening here. Okay, so this is one model. That, sorry, this is the model we have defined in the form of a function now. Here now I'm calling the function and I'm saying fit it and the same size. We have no change in our epochs and run model. So when I run it through, if you can observe here, the network is performing more pathetic. The network is going down up to 27%. I mean, testing part also is 27%. So what does it show is that if I use the random weights, or if I use versus, if I use some kind of itemized weights, which I have, the model performance is going down for 100 epochs. Now there could be a chance if I would have run this across for 1000 epochs, we would have got some better results because if you observe here, epoch by epoch, it is increasing. But if by doing this thousand over here, it will be computationally costly for us. So this is not a very good option to do this. All right. So in this case, it is not working at all. So now we'll go to some other functionality. So if you observe here, we are using only sigmoid, right? So it's not necessary to always use sigmoidal function only. Let's try to change some of our activation functions. So the function here we are using is ReLU. So let's go to non-linearity part of it and push all the ReLUs over here. And finally, the output is off max. There is no change, exactly code as it is. This is also as it is, but here, if you observe, I have changed the number of epochs. In 10 epochs itself, I'm getting a better answer why to spend more time. So if I run 10 epochs, I'm able to achieve 84% of accuracy. And the same thing when I run it across to my testing part, I get 83.6, which is 84. So it's working good. Yeah. Uh, the, just one question here, Sushant. Hmm. Is it necessary that we use all uh, the same activation function for no, all no. the hidden layers or can we miss it? Not necessary at all. You can use different ones. Let's, let's, let's try this once. Okay, just give me a minute. We'll try to modify something here. Okay, let's, let's modify this one only. Let's try to call this. So let us say instead of this, uh, what if I say here as uh, sigmoid? And we just need to check, do I have to run anything else? Uh, we ran till here, I think we'll run this. And we'll run a sequential model. Okay, we'll not run the above ones. We don't want to confuse it. Where is it? Yeah, so let's run this up. Okay, and let's fire this up. So from first two epochs itself will come to know how is the model performance. So we started with 45. Okay, we'll wait for one more epoch. 67, a very good increase. You can say around 22 percentage of increase. 72, 74, 75. Okay, 77. Now if you see the percentage increase is kind of decreasing over the line. Yeah. 70, I think it will cross 80, yes. 82. So in last case, if it was all ReLUs, it was working better. Now when it's sigmoid in middle, it's working a little different. So now let's do one thing. Let's try to caps, caps it up saying that on the fifth epoch, I got 77% accuracy, right? Let's try to change one more as sigmoid. And I'll try to reduce this because if I overwrite my network, no, at, the, at one point the network will be heavily loaded. So we'll do once or twice, not more than that. 
just wanted to show you by changing the activation function how output changes. See, last time we started with 45 something, now we started with 28. So on the fifth epoch, we were around 70 last time. Now we will either, I think we'll cross 60, yeah? So the model performance for this particular data set is decreasing if we are putting sigmoidal function. So this is more optimal on ReLU. Please remember that, all right? So it's not always that ReLU will work better, but some of the data works good on ReLU especially when you have a non-linear data that works perfectly on ReLU. So uh, let me do one thing. Let me increase the learning rate and uh, let me say increase the number of epochs. Let's spend some time and check it out. You see that guys? Something is weird here, right? Yeah, it's stuck somewhere. Yes, so just wanted to show you what happened was Whenever you do this, no, what happens? This uh, Keras does not understand that we are retrying it. What Keras does? Keras tries to overwrite these layers. And sometimes what happens in that process, we kind of attach. So if we already have five layers, no, above this five layers, we have more 10 layers, to be very frank, which we did earlier. So this is a standard uh, you know, rerun problem within Keras. So please be very careful onto this. If you observe now, the the thing is running as it is. <laughs> okay, so we, we ran into that issue. So please be a little careful. Uh, I'll show you how to do testing onto that. Uh, we can call, we can keep some function, callable function about it, and we can keep calling it as the reason we are you know, putting in the function. Even the function in this case, it's kind of failing. There's a clear, there's a clear function for the model, right? Uh, yeah. To reinitialize the whole model. Correct, correct. Yes, it is there. I have never used it though, because in one or two trials itself, I get the stuff ready, but yeah, uh, you're perfectly right. It is, it is available. So I'll do one thing is I will just kill this as of now. And then I'll, when I give you guys, I'll give you the original model as it was. All right. So this is what it is. So if I would have gone up to 20 epochs onto our normal ReLU, ReLU, ReLU soft mix, we would have crossed 90% also, nothing wrong with that. So this is works. This, this is how a neural network could be, uh, you know, trained onto that. Now this is not it. So this was uh, just a check on to how activation functions operate onto them. Now moving further, we even we can talk about bash normalization. If you remember, bash normalization is nothing but your uh, regularization or normalization that we usually use in machine learning. What are we doing sometimes? Sometimes what happens is if there is a weights are pretty high, the multiplied input will be high and also the sigmoidal or ReLU that we have that could shoot up on the maximum level. So there might be some numbers which are very low and there could be some of these outliers which are pretty high. So this also creates a kind of amplification from input to output. So just to keep in check, after every layer, you can put normalization. Now it's not necessary to put it after every layer. You can also say that one layer has it, another layer won't have it. Especially if you have ReLU, no? please put normalization. Because ReLU is, if, you, if you're seeing the curve, ReLU kinds of, it has got an increasing curve. So there are chances that you might have extreme values. So better to have it on ReLU. For sigmoid and tangential, what's gonna happen is, sigmoidal is very controlled curve. So the maximum you're gonna go is one, minimum you're gonna go is minus one. Uh, can you explain this uh, best normalization a bit more? Uh -huh. Yeah. So see, what happens here is, um, say for example, uh, your input was a value called uh, 24, for example. Yeah. Now this went through some weight. Now it's a randomized weight. We don't know what that weight value be. Let us say the weight value was 100. So what is the output we are going to get? The output will be 2400, for example. Now this 2400 enters into your activation functions. Now let us say the activation function we are using is ReLU here. So if you observe the ReLU curve, what's going to happen? ReLU, anyway, it's a positive number. So ReLU is an increasing curve. So there are chances that the same number could be pass through across. So what we do now is just to keep a check on it after ReLU, I push one small layer, which I call it as normalization layer. And I say that use our uh, uh, standard scalar or normalization concept and bring back this number in scale with the other numbers in the network, which are going to come out. So if we have some scatters, you know, like this, next, what we do is after normalization, it will rotate around the, access something like this so all we are doing is we are just trying to 
limit the okay. range of the number. Failing. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just a hint is uh, this should be the last resort basically. If nothing is working, then you can say that okay, let's introduce normalization and especially before and after ELO, if you do it, this works pretty good. Sigmoid, you don't need it because sigmoid anyway auto auto corrects itself, so uh, doesn't matter. So now we have done this. Uh, when we run the epochs, if you observe, we are able to scale it up to eighty five. So I will not say it's a bad number; it's a good number. But in the last model that we saw at tenth epoch itself, we were getting eighty four plus. So yes, somehow it has helped us. Uh, not a very ideal, uh, ideally, but yes, it's kind of better now. All right. So this is your batch normalization concept. Last part is your dropout function. So a dropout can be, if you remember the dropout is we can switch off certain neurons randomly. So how do you like, how do I say 20% switch off again is a uh, manual number that you need to think about. So please remember where you have got huge number of neurons as an input, this could come out very handy. So sometimes not all the neurons are contributing great towards the output. What happens is some of these neurons get junk values and they create the back propagation experience pathetic. So in this back propagation, the Adam or SGD has to take care of all these unwanted neurons also sometimes, which has got junk values. So rather than fo focusing on the good neurons, sometimes it has to, you know, struggle just because of these people. Yeah. This is what we call as gradient loss and all. We will discuss uh, in, 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 in neural uh, NLP in your next to next module anyway in detail. But this is what happens if you have a very long layer of uh, neurons. So just to control it, I'm saying switch off this layers 20% neurons, 20%, 20%, 20%. So why I use the same number so that you guys get some flow out of it. It's not necessary to put one dropout and uh, put all the dropouts. It's, you can just use one dropout in one layer and then move it up all right so just to keep uniformity i've done this but when i give you this code you can you guys can try it out just keep neurons uh, dropouts only for some layers and omit it for others the network is that network might work better okay, uh, so dro dropout dropout has only one parameter of the percentage or anything else as well uh as far as i know that's all we have under dropout let's check it out if i can Shift tab is not working. That is weird. Because uh, with this way, there is no uh, control of which kind of uh, neurons we want to drop. Yeah. Because okay. it will eventually just uh, take some random 20% uh, and drop it off. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, yeah. it might basically, rather than uh, yeah. increasing the performance, it might decrease as well. Yes. So, yes. Correct. So this is, uh, again, I'll say this is randomized. We have no control over it. Um, if you want, uh, let us say, I have never done this. It's a very good thought. I've never done this in my career. Let me see if I if I can have a manual control. But as far as I know, we don't do it. We just randomly put a number and uh, we observe the output once. If we feel it is going good, at least from first two epochs itself, you'll come to know. Okay, so um, if you observe here from 70, we are jumping to 79. And after a certain point, it will become stabilized. Yeah. So again, at the end of 10 epochs, we are coming at 84. So no matter we had dropout, uh, we did not have earlier dropout, we have dropout. This network is resting around 84% itself at level of 10 epochs. Yeah. So yes, so these are the maximum things which we can do uh, to train it. Now what you guys do is when I give you this code, you guys mix match all of these. So here, if I use dropout, I have not used, uh, what do you say, uh, this one, uh, uh, different function. So what you can guys can do is you can mix match all these four techniques into one neural network and try it out what you get out of it. So um, I think uh, more or less this is it. The maximum you can do is this, not anything more than this possible. And also uh, try to have some control over the layer. So if after doing all of this till you feel it's not working good, you can either remove one layer or add an extra layer as an output. Yeah, not softmax. Before softmax, you can add one more layer. Now what I've done is I've done 50, 50, 50, 50, 10. Again, that's not perfectly right from my side. Yeah, you can do 
500 is to 25, sorry, 500 is to 250 is to 125 is to 60, it's to 30. And then from 30, you can converge to 10. You can try even these kind of different uh, numbers of neurons. All right. So just to show you guys quickly. Yeah, here it is, right to struggle. Huh. So look at my computer vision neural network. So this is what it starts with. Look at the size of it. And this is where it ends. <clears throat> so out of this neural network, this is your fully connected neural network. Only the last four of them. The above ones are CNNs. So if you look at the size, I'm not changing anyway. I'm just keeping it constant. And suddenly on the output layer, I am saying softmax has 17 classes. So nothing wrong into this. It works perfectly good. Okay. If you want to see the representation of it, this is how it looks like. So the first uh, 15 layers that I have is my convolution layer. You can ignore it for now. This is what is your fully connected layer that you are doing. And also if you observe in my network here, I am not using anything else. I'm just using ReLU. I'm using some input and a kind of dropout. Why? Because I have 4,000 odd neurons. It's okay to use a high number of dropout. So you don't have to use any of these fancy things. At the end of the day, even a simple neural network like this also works. What does this code do? This code detects the face from a, from a set of images. A very complex code, yet a simple neural network like this works properly. Yeah, so the one which we are showing you is just for your practice purpose. Actually, you don't have to even you know, go through all of these pain of all of these featureization. Uh, but just as a part of uh, this module, this is what it is maximum we can do. Okay, so this is one thing. Uh, let me show you one more neural network quickly. I'll show you two different newer versions of this. So if you look at this, uh, I think we have, I have shown you this code earlier also. What do we have? We are predicting whether the defect is low, medium or high. Low means zero, medium means one and high means two. So we're just predicting zero, one and two out of this data set. That's all. So first of all, I started with all of our decision tree and random forest and all that. And at the end, I'm ending up with our uh, machine, uh, sorry, AI neural network part of it. And if you look at the network, the network is pretty simple. Where is my network? Yeah, the network is as simple as this. Input layer, one dense layer, and one output layer. That's it. It is working perfect. It is giving me an accuracy of around 80 or 90%, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, 84% for 100 epochs. It's a very good model with just using three of them. Yeah, so after even 100, 200 epochs, if you still feel that the accuracy is not increasing, then please go back and do all these changes, whatever we saw here. Yeah, one more example. If we talk about an AI based chatbot, yeah, so it's a very complex code. Yet, I will show you the neural network. The neural network is very simple here. Yeah, this is all is my neural network. Now, you might find a little weird here because I'm not using Keras. This neural network is per perfectly or purely designed only on TensorFlow. Yeah, I'll take you guys through this journey also. Okay, so what do we have? If you look at my neural network, what do I have? I've got an input layer. I've got two dense layers. Now I've got one output layer. That's it. What is the size of it? Eight, eight. Output is the uh, size of target. That is, I think if I'm not wrong, it is six or seven if I'm not wrong. And input is exactly equal to my input size. That's it. So such a complex uh, chatbot, a simple neural network works perfectly. Yeah. And if you look at the number of epochs, I have run it across. I have run epochs around 200. That's the reason it is pretty good. Yeah. So either you change your hyperparameters, use for less epochs, or let it run for larger epochs. It will normalize itself anyway. Look at the accuracy I'm getting. I'm getting an accuracy. Uh, okay, there is no accuracy here. Let us say I'm getting a loss of 0 0.87, 0 0.87. Yeah. But when I use it as a form of chatbot, it performs very good. It gives me almost all the outputs. You know? Uh, so once you guys are comfortable with uh, NLP and all this stuff, no, I'll, I'll show you this uh, complete implementation. Okay, so this is what I have used chatbots onto so far. And also some of these cases, we have used it for image classification like this. So your project is almost similar to this. So this code should work, but 
The only difference is in the project, they're also talking about KNN, correct? So let's, let's discuss. So uh, we'll close down for neural networks. If you guys have any confusion, do let me know. We can take it up. Mm -hmm. Ashish, Ganesh, Hema, Mohit, Nitesh, Raju, Ramesh, anything? It's very straightforward. Um, okay. I, I am, I'm very happy that there is a backdrop in which we should take care of all of our troubles. To be very frank. <laughs> we, yes. <laughs> yeah. We create the mesh, it cleans it up. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Can you zoom out to the system a little bit, browse a little bit, uh, Krishna? Like, yeah. yeah. Mm, zoom in. One more? Yeah. Is it okay now? Or one more? One more, yes. Okay. No, 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 I'm saying zoom out, I'm saying zoom out, I'm saying. Oh, You're zoom zooming out. out. Zoom, zoom. Okay. Just a sec. Zoom out. Let me know when to stop. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. All right. Okay, good. So this was all. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, I think that, that's, that's all majorly we can do it. Now let's do one thing. Uh, let's talk about your project in detail so that you people have no confusions onto that. Just give me a minute. I'll go to your dashboard. And uh, let me know your batch. This is... Uh, September ni. This is which batch? June, July? Uh, July. 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 Okay, July. Look, what a variety of batches with me. So I have to find out. July batches, neural network. Uh, no, this is June. Mm, this is me. You guys, you are in June batch, if I'm not wrong. I think this should be your. Yes. yes. Last started and it's been long. Yeah. So let's check it out. Uh, February 9th is a submit. I think this is yours. Only. Correct. So what do we have? Let's uh, let's try to see the project. I think it is the same one that I'm assuming it is. Digital digit classification using that MNIST data, right? Yes. S V H N data set. I got it. Perfect. Now. Um, let's discuss on to this and how we can do it. What are the possibilities? How will you import the data? How will you save the data? And let's, let's uh, try to think, uh, talk about that. Now, let me give you an overview of what these guys want from your side is just a minute. Uh, uh, do we have a PDF or something? No. Okay. Let's uh, download this up and also uh, let us download the uh, data set also. Okay, I have the data set. Let, let us run the same, uh, same part. Okay, now comes the real challenge where we are having some, some, some kind of uh, images. So first of all, let me show you what are these images and how do you see them. So I'll give you some hints on that. Yeah. Good. So we have a handful of uh, things only. We don't have the complete stuff here. Now, what do we have? So first thing we need to understand is what is this H5PY format? Yeah. So we call this as HDF format. This is the latest version. That is version number five. This has been built for Python. Now, what is this? Let us dig uh, deep into that. Now, one image usually. So we just saw a 28 cross 28 image is of size 784 bytes for example all right now imagine if i say it's a one megapixel image okay what do you whatever you call them mbp whatever we call about yeah imagine the size of this obviously it's one mega we know that there are some images which are uh, say three mega in size okay some hd images so if i pack sixty thousand of these and transfer it to you how heavy it's going to be right so now nobody does this nobody actually keeps the original image what do we do is we keep the encoded version of this now what do i mean by encoded you can convert these images into what 
into some kind of matrices. Now let me show you what do I mean by, uh, actually I mean by this. So, so if you observe, this is how the image gets pixeled up. So right now just imagine this is a black and white image where zero represents black and white represents the number 255. Now I hope you people get it how I got 255. It's 2 power 8 minus 1. Yeah. So you can imagine if I give this way or else if I can give you something in the form of a matrix like this. And what if I can package 60,000 of these matrices into a file, into zip into a file and deliver. So the way we saw our MNIST data set in our neural network example just now, that was also a packaged version of it. So what exactly they have on the back end? What did I download? I downloaded these things. What are these numbers? You can easily say the darkest one is near to zero and the lightest one is near to 255. This is the number representation of this. And now when you push this image through some of these Python uh, plot uh, plotting stuff, one of the example is I am show, image show. And in that you just put this matrix, it will auto convert itself. It will understand it's a one uh, uh, channeled image and it is converting itself and it will show you some kind of output like this. <laughs> so similar thing is an HDF format. What does HDF do is, uh, hierarchical data format, what does it do is, it packages large number of uh, images, it converts them into kind of matrices and it packages them. And also along with this, it tries to attach a tag. So if you observe here, uh, not here, if you observe here, down the line when I'm printing your image data set, your, your project data set, it looks something like this. So these are the images that we are having currently, okay? And each image is having a tag. Do you see this? Actually, what are the numbers present here? Can I say one, two, and eight? But the person who has designed it has tagged it to two. That means the number two is more in focus here. So I just want to identify one number out of it. This image represents tag number six. That means what? no matter how you have written, this is number six. Okay, so they call it SVHN data set that is street view something something. Yeah, so what Google is doing done is from Google uh, street view uh, website, when they take a snapshot, <clears throat> they might get some numbers of the streets or houses or cars, whatever it is, into this kind of format. Might be good uh, readable format, might not be readable format. So our duty now here is to input this into our neural network along with the target, train the neural network such a that when the testing data, let us say this is the testing data and this is the training data. When the testing data is passed on to the neural network, it should predict what is there as output. That's it. Yeah. Can you go to this uh, uh, loading file? What yeah, we'll do that. We'll do it one by one. So we'll go back top. So this, this whole thing was just to explain you guys what is H5PY format. Fifth, latest version of HDF Python format, right? Next is your uh, pandas and numpy. The first thing that we are doing is we are loading up our H5 file. So what is this H5 file? It looks like this. So here we are not uh, putting any path and all, just uh, we need to uh, just write the file Down. name. Correct, perfectly correct. So here. Oh, how, how, how it will read like you know, on what? From here, it? from here. This is the H5 file that is present in my local directory. And now I'm telling, please import them. That means you know, I, I, can, I can put it in any, any folder in my computer. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, so no, that's no, the no, 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 local folder for where that's your code problem. is present. If there is no code, then you have to put a path over here. So what you can do is, you can do like this path is equal to, say you put your path, whatever is your path, C slash, whatever it is. And then over here, while reading it, you say path, plus all right uh, okay. all right so this is what you can do but usually you put it in your local drive now where the code is present it'll be easy for you to import it also oh, and otherwise, otherwise i think there is one more uh, um, uh, thing we can uh, directly we can import and uh, uh, it will read automatically from our uh, computer right yeah yeah yes yes Very even good. you can import it from web also if there's a web link if you get this as a web link you can do that also 
Uh, what I'm asking is, mm. suppose I okay, store this particular file in the mm. one of the my folder, you know, not irrespective of code file. You know, some mm. new folder I'll create and I'll put it mm. in my desktop. Correct. So then I can use this code directly. This H file into mm. H file is equal to H file py dot file is there, no? Mm. This code I can use, but before that, I have to import one library. I, I saw this some video, I'm not getting that. No, the library is this H5P web. Um, this is the library. We are referencing clearly that from this library, you get a file of this name. So if it is not there in your local directory, you put a path here. Okay. Path, top, right? path plus. Ha, path plus here. Okay. Hey, we can use Colab also, right? For this? Yeah, Colab, yes, Colab is a one stop solution. For <laughs> yeah. Then we have to mount the Google Drive Correct. to Colab, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. So, this is the way you can import. And what do you mean by R is read? If you write W, that is write. And if you want to read, write both the accesses, then you can just put RW plus. If you want the details about these fields, I will pass on the Wikipedia link to this. You can just check it out. For now, we just need to read the files. I don't want to update anything in my original database. Good. But, but, but Krishna, Krishna, the, um, uh, the what are Lincoln's example that you gave. There is one yeah. So in this case, we are having 60,000 data itself. So if you add 42 and 18, we are getting 60,000 again. Yeah. And it also has got the uh, um, uh, result column also. Yeah, the result the column. Way. Yes, it has a result column, which is present in the form of Y. It is already tagged. The person who has made this has already tagged it. So if you ask me how we has tagged it, yes, we will do down the line. Once you enter computer vision, I'll show you guys how to do embeddings also on your images. But for now, this is your target. Okay. Your independent variables. Okay. All right. And okay. it has been already named it. So the, the, if I say X train, if I call X train from this, there is an already one uh, tag given to all the training data. So that's what we are lucky about. Otherwise, what we could have done is we could have imported this into new X and Y and from there we would have done the split part of it. But in this case, we already have it. So please use it directly. Yeah. And finally, just to... So, sorry, sorry. All, all H5 files, files have got this? Or how is it? No, no, no. The, all person, H5 files, no, no. the person who has designed it has done it for us. Uh, down the line, when we do computer vision, other files, not all of them have done this actually. But yes, to start up with, we were, they were kind enough to give us targets at least. They were already tagged images like this. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you some more examples. I'll show you some more examples today from computer vision. Okay. All right. So now moving forward, if we have opened a file, we have to close the file. Also. Otherwise, it will be an unwanted. Uh, uh, it's a huge file basically. So it will be unwanted headache. So please, whenever you open it, after you read it, close it down. Next thing is just publish the shape. So just look at the shapes. We have got 32 cross 32 images. That means one image is 32 into 32. That could be what? Uh, 30, 30 is a 900, 900 into four, 904 odd pixels onto that. All right. So this is what it is. And your testing data is 18K, same thing. Uh, your target variables should exactly match with your number of images here because one image is equal to one target. All right. So I think this is pretty obvious. You guys got it. If you want to see how does an image look like one, uh, let us say I want to print top three images. How do they look like? This is how it is. So let me run it through. We'll play around with these images. Okay, so let us say I want to just look at the zeroth image. And this is how a zero image looks like. And also you'll observe we are not able to print all 900 values which are missing. So this could be some top rows and columns. These are some top rows and columns of so one image. So if I ask you guys that uh, zero is black and uh, one is white, for example, you can just correlate your numbers. Are you able to get it? Yes. 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 
perfect and now if you want to see what is this image belonging to you can just say show me the target column of this particular image it is image number two so if you observe also the zeroth image is nothing but image number two perfectly matching take some time it will take some time for you guys to get adjusted to this because cv in whole of your computer vision you will be looking at these things only <laughs> okay so get take some time play around with this stuff get adjusted to what it is uh, if you want to say publish the night basically you are converting the image to a numpy array right correct perfectly done yeah yes that's okay that's it yes perfectly identified now moving on please use this uh, always till you get comfortable or I, I even in my hi fi computer vision codes also i go as basic as this because we need to know what is there on back end usually when you see the blogs online and all none, none of them they do this why they directly start working on to this and as a new person to this technology you will not be comfortable looking at these things so please publish this for to publish this you need only one thing is i am show that's it image show from matplotlib and try to publish the data and have a look at it what exactly it looks like so this number which you see 128 or the image that you see 128 over here actually looks like this in the matrix form okay so um, let's say we try to play around color map what kind of color map i need say i need a gray colored image in that case if you want to be more comfortable with gray scale image just push a gray scale image if you don't push anything it will take rgb by default okay say you want greens for example uh, yeah you will get completely in green if you want reds you will completely in reds okay if you want blues i have never tried blue let's try it will be in blues all right so this is how you uh, define it say you want uh, from 30 to uh, say 30 to 50 that is around 20 20 of them and uh, my starting point i will say uh, say i can define I define i is equal to say 30 for example mm, that's an error Uh, that is weird can't i do this can't i do this uh, no 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 because range will give you 1 to 20 yeah, increase oh, the range i will okay okay got it got it okay hmm so what i will do now is the range 30 comma 50 or something okay so the 20 is to 50 okay yeah you know it'll this will not work for sure that i know that Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Okay. No. No. <laughs> It will not work. I have tried this. I I have a solution for this. What we can do is we can define something called higher number, say fifty, and a lower number, say twenty, for example. And here I will define as it is. We will say fifty minus uh, high minus low. and uh, the logic here could be uh, i will say i uh, plot plot this thing uh, i will say i plus uh, high i plus low i plus low yes okay. let's see give okay, one why what is an issue here it is telling me i can't do this i plus one Oh, yeah let's let's remove this let's say 30 here okay this did two days back i coded this where we have displayed it yeah here it is oh there is no if loop there okay okay there is no if loop there if and for is not there mm. okay fine i don't i don't think so that's a problem for us right now but just in case if you want to display some range Uh, let's see how we can do it okay so for top 10 values it works good why it is not working good here okay let us say if i say something like low value is say 20 and high value is say 
So and range syntax is start comma stop. Range start syntax. comma stop. Start okay. comma stop. It is like so ten comma like twenty. Twenty comma twenty comma fifty. Fifty. It yeah. didn't work. No, that's the reason. Yeah. I'm skeptical here. Why? Why it's not working? That that range is working, but it is again uh, stopped at the i plus one. Looks right. Probably uh, instead of i, uh, put it low plus one. But then we need to increment low also. Then okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's increment it here. Uh, low plus plus, or I will say low is equal to low plus one. Okay. Yeah, should work. I think so. Probably work. just remove this uh, low plus one at completely from here, then the top. This yeah. one. Yeah, because we in, since we are already increasing, just put it low only. Yeah. Okay. Ah, should okay. Work. Correct. Correct. Good. And let me also remove this uh, i. Uh, low. Low. It should be low. Yeah. No, but we need to define i, right? Because i is what is getting iterated here. So you are kind of right. Let's try with uh, i plus low. Let's try this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it is gonna. What you is. must have number one. Blah blah. No, it is it's just throwing it. error here itself. Ah, huh, obviously, no subplot should be thirty, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is publishing the image, but it is not uh, not thirty one. Okay, okay. So from zero to twenty nine. So let me. Okay, fine. I'll do one thing: is I will try to figure this out. Why this is happening? I'll try to figure this out. I'll give you some solution onto this. Let me see. I did this, but this was no for loop here, so it worked in a better way. But it's okay. It is only giving me predictions. That's it. Okay, no problem. So let's not waste time onto that. So this is how you can uh, basically go through your data and uh, you know try to publish it. I try to correct it also. Right, there is no low here. Okay, let's see. Still, there is a problem. Instead of low, put it I. Yes. So this is I plus one. No? Yeah. Okay. Good. So now this is what maximum I could show you. Anything beyond that will be a problem. Now what I need to do. So the first thing you guys have to do is design and network. So what will be your network? If somebody can quickly let me know. So I will give you some steps. Please follow the steps. So now after this, please remember, first thing you have to do is you have to encode. Encode what? Encode your target. So that is nothing but your Y train and Y test. Hot, hot encoding is needed. Post this, what you guys will do, you will decide your neural network. Now, how will you do that? Somebody can quickly start. What should be my input layer? What should be my first layer, I will say. How much is that? What was the size? Uh, 32 cross 32. Okay. Let's check, 30 to 32, yes. Yeah. So just multiply that, right? Yes. Yeah. So I will say my first uh, layer uh, layer is equal to 32 cross 32. Yeah. Input is this. What other parameters we have? We need to define what will be the total number of weights going to the next layer. Now, how will you decide that? Let it be random only. <laughs> Ah, so how will you choose a number? That's what I'm, I'm, I'm coming to. Random means what you will put. You will put a more number than 32 or a lesser number than 32. What is it? Uh, can you repeat the question again? Uh, yeah, better. the question is, if you remember the neural network. Uh, just yeah. So for example, we just did an image classifier, right? So the network that you see, the network that we built, you remember we are yeah. pushing some weight. Yeah. Yeah. What should be my size of my hidden layer? That's it. So you can say the first hidden layer should be a what size? Say make it um, multiple. So, this. so if this is 32, 32 is 904. If I'm not wrong, just say you make it um, 400 or 450 or something like that. All right. An activation function you start with relu. Yeah. Then second layer. 
you now i think you people got it second layer should be 400 input yeah yeah uh, relu should be our say something like this that's it third layer let us say this is your next dense layer in your next dense layer keep reducing it say from 200 you push down to 400 you push down to 200 for example push relu fourth layer if you want it more the layer better will be stability of your model huh? please remember that so 100 let us say you're talking about relu now fifth layer now total outputs how many i have did we check on to that how many classes we should have zero to nine zero to nine obviously so we are going to have nine sorry we are going to have 10 outputs agreed so for 10 outputs 100 we weights converging to 10 i feel sometimes is not that fair so what you do at least you put some 50 or in worst case you put 25 and then put value and then your sixth layer say sixth layer could be your um, uh, soft match so in that case you have got 10 inputs or 10 outputs sorry and this will be your soft max try this check the accuracy if you are still feeling that there is an issue please put a dropout okay. don't uh, go beyond 50 percent of dropout because it, it, it the, the the whole uh funda of neural network will will fly away because if we, if we don't want that many nodes why did we initialize them anyway we use dropout if still you feel there is a problem here use batch normalization okay. especially use batch normalization wherever you have used relu please again remember that so in here we have used all relus so to do that right so this could be a possible network that you guys can take it. I can bring you guys just for your reference. Now, this is not ultimate way of doing it. I'm just, just, just vaguely scripted something. Yeah. So this will give you output of your first question in the project, which says, please design a neural network, which will be able to predict. Okay. Now let me open that. Okay. Uh, uh, have they given what to do? Okay, data fetching, five points. Implementing and applying deep neural network, okay, 10 points. Understanding and be able to implement vectorized back propagation, yes, we know this, okay, we have done this. Implement batch normalization training neural network, we have done this. Plin the, okay, good. So there is no KNN involved here, very nice. Good, they have changed the project then. Okay, so all you need to do is whatever I just pasted, that's all you need to do. <laughs> Yeah, in the earlier project, which your earlier batches had, no, my earlier batches, what they wanted was, there was one more point here, use KNN to do the same job, and then compare KNN versus your neural network. Pretty difficult, yeah? So, if anybody is able to complete this early, no, please come back or let me know. I will give you one more small assignment to use your machine learning classification techniques to do the same job. Can we do it? Have you thought about it? I, we have solved the project. Project's done. It's not a big deal at all. <laughs> we have almost done it. All you need to do is get the better accuracy. So you need to slog a little onto these numbers. That's it. This brings us to the end of this tutorial on image processing using Python. Now let's have a quick recap. We started off by understanding the concept of image processing. Then we had a demo on image processing with neural networks. Now, before you guys sign off, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free learning platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud, and digital marketing. So the link for GLA would be available in the description below. Thank you and happy learning.